This is the part of a video where William's not here. It's just me and a cat, but... <laughs> Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of your favorite podcast, Unresolved Textual Tension. It's me, your host, Maria, and with me today is my ruggedly handsome co-host, William. Hey guys, looking rugged, looking handsome. And what book today are we doing, Maria? We are doing The Left-Handed Booksellers of London by Garth Nix, an author who Will and I have read in our childhood. We have previously read uh, his book, Sabriel, for the channel, which we both really enjoyed. Adore. I'm going to say, Will, I now that I've finished this book, I feel much better about it than I did Halfway through. I did as well. It took me about to the last third to get really gripped in. But then I was like, oh, I'm kind of much more into this than I was before. But I also just think it is the best YA. It's like, <laughs> like as far as like a modern YA mm -hmm. and, and something that would connect to... Because Sabriel definitely feels like a, a product of its time. And I think a yeah. lot of modern teenagers would struggle because like when we read Sabriel, none of our viewers liked it. They found that Sabriel herself didn't have a lot of personality and, and she is, it is written very distant to the characters. And I think this is a really solid why a enjoyable uh, with a good, and, and like, I'm not going to lie. I think the thing that really won me over was the fact that there was that point where they were like, and now we're going to let the adults do the dangerous stuff. And we're <laughs> going to go to a hotel. And then like that didn't work, but still it was the result, the adults doing mm -hmm. the actual dangerous fighting stuff in the kids. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> JK Rowling could never like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing is, um, I, I, it's interesting because for about the first two thirds, I thought this book was mostly harmless. And then in the last third, I, I found it more enjoyable and, and engaging. Um, but a lot of what I did was compare and contrasting this both to other Garth Nick books in terms of what he does well and what he doesn't and also all of the other secret society books that we've read that have not been good um <laughs> and have kind of been terrible but i think you're also right in terms of this has a ya for a younger ya feel rather than ya smut for 30 year old women feel um and so there are parts of it that like no you're not supposed to take it super realistically at times and the characters feel like 18 and 19 and 20 year olds you know like like, mm -hmm. they they have moments where they have maturity but then there's moments when they're like not mature, like like and it just it worked and listen it's not the greatest book ever but it was an easy read it was relatively like the parts where i wasn't super engaged it was still like relatively enjoyable um and the ending really like pulls it together i'm i am way more interested in reading the second book once I finished it, then I was like two thirds the way through. So originally the plan had been, we were going to read this one and the sequel for this review. And then about halfway through, I was like, I don't really want to read the sequel. I don't think it really makes sense. The reason we were going to do it is so because sequels do poorly on our channel. So we were like, okay, we'll just do two at one. But yeah, now I'm, I'm not really motivated to read it, but I'm much more okay with it. One of the things that I think Garth Nix does so well is world building. Um, even in like small little things, his world building is great. That's one of the reasons I kept reading his um, Keys to the Kingdom series is because he just kept coming up with really creative stuff, even if the plot and the characters were a little meh at times. And this one, and in this book, it's less on display, the kind of like uh, old world with new world, magic versus mundane kind of theme than with, keys to the kingdom which is how would you describe the, the concept of keys to the kingdom british 18th century angels in a crumbling house <laughs> like it's a great concept some of the books are so surreal it's like kind of surrealist ya fantasy mm -hmm. like i'm just thinking of like the wednesday one with the leviathan uh-huh like, or the rats it, like it's just it's a bit surreal and dreamlike and like incredibly atmospheric but not like old world new world like no. it's just like com it, it is a very i would love to revisit that series with you because i too i haven't read it since i was in high school and i remember thinking of it fondly at the time um 
But in retrospect, I think about it, I'm like, what a weird. It was great. It was like, yeah. what if the what if God had um basically a bureaucracy for running the universe that were angels, but it took them forever to catch up to modern time. So even in modern times, they're still dressing like it's the 18th century. And then also the way, anyway, uh, those are books that I just continued reading because I loved their world building. And this was the same way, in the same way that I actually really liked the world building Sabriel as well. This one in terms of tone was like Sabriel, I felt as well as because you're a little bit more distant than the characters um, than in a normal, you're more distant from the characters than in a normal book. I don't think it works as well as Sabriel. Sabriel, I think, works better because she's a more active character in the first third than Susan is in this one. And then also the final battle in Sabriel, like, oh, God, that was such a great sequence. And in this one, I was like, this is action hero action, but it's not gripping me. It's the difference between like a fight scene in a Marvel movie where you're like, OK, they found a stunt coordinator. He decided to do three things. The director was like, you go do your own thing. And they did it in a pocket versus like the ride of the Rohirrim in Return of the King, which every single say. time. Yeah. Gives you chills because it's a, a, a great um, melding of the story and the action together. This felt like, OK, we're doing the kicky punchy thing because it's the end of the book. Whereas in Sabriel, it's like, no, the dark tide is a coming. So for me, I agree. But I think most readers are going, especially most modern like teenagers are going to enjoy and connect with this book more than Sabriel. The fall of the youth, microplastics. Sabriel is an old world heroine. I will say that Garth Nix has the kind of um, tone to his writing of the old school, like I'm a professor writing a story for children, like very, very like the Hobbit-esque where and it's like, Diana I'm an old Wynne man. Wynne Jones. Like, yeah, like, exactly. Reading this book and then going straight into There was a reference House. to power to one of her books in this. Yes, it, it was. Yeah. It, it was at the beginning when she was talking about all the different uh, books in the, but, um, and, and so this very much has a feel because like I'm currently reading Howl's Moving Castle because that's the book we're doing this weekend. And going from that, to that just had like a weird like like garth nix jones like there's just this like era of mm -hmm. authors uh and uh, like garth nix is like the last holdout of um that that we have going right now and so this is the a kind of book where if i had kids i would happily like sabriel is something i would read aloud to them and experience with them but this i'd be like read this book that is actually a really good point yeah that that they're different they're they're different in that way this is also something you could give to like a 12 year old where sabriel is more like a 16 to 17 year old i think i don't know i read sabriel when i was like well 10, i read it when i was like so, 10 yeah i was so gonna I was, say so was <laughs> um it's very odd to me how much more i like this book after i finished it it's kind of like um what was that one sci-fi book we read auxiliary justice yes uh mm -hmm. and ancillary justice uh, where I enjoyed it so much more after I finished it than I did during the initial like two thirds. I was that way with spending silver. And part of this is I just think it's like a solid, simple, straightforward YA um, in like the way that I wish more YA was. Like the world mm -hmm. building's pretty solid. I like this was one of the attempts at showing like a diverse male love interest that didn't feel like <laughs> stupid stupid like i in love merlin he's he, i i don't i don't know if you like him i there was points where i was like he's gonna hate this character and then there's other points where i was like maybe he won't i didn't feel strongly about him one way or another i thought he was like oh this is the cross of mogget and cersei susan turquoise blue from um the keys to the kingdom series like it's a kind of a stock him character but i thought he was fine i mean i think that's the other thing is he plays to his strengths a lot in this which is um british uh dialogue <laughs> essentially is what i would call it he has he writes very solid dialogue he really does him and tams and muir he's also allowed to write dialogue according to the writers bar association yes. that i run i was overall pretty impressed with this i think it's a very solid book i think if you have read garth nix before you'll like this um, I think if you're going in here looking for torrid fairy smut or first person, you know what, you know, actually, and you're not going to like this, but what I, this really contrasted with me is children of blood and bone, which is like such an, just in terms of mode, this is an old YA mode and that's a very new YA mode. And it's maybe not fair to compare the two because children of blood and bone is so bad, but 
it kind of reminded me of the difference between the two. This is not first person sort of present tense. It's not, there's no love triangle. There's no like. But there's so many. I mean, Children of Blood of Bone is just one of many that we've read that's done that. And and so for me, it was just like in a, sw- in a like literally in a just year slash coming on in October, it'll be two years that we've been doing this. Hey. Maria, though, how are we able to have been doing this for two years? Like, why aren't we homeless? Why is our Wi-Fi working? What's going on with that? I have a full-time job. (laughs) But! I guess there's no need for funding from our viewers, Maria. Yes, because I also need a reason to do this on top of having a full-time job and a social life and, you know, trying to go to the gym three times a week. Can you guys tell? Gains. Show us your gains. No, not yet. I've only been doing it for, like, (laughs) a month. Go away. We have a Patreon. It's a really good time. We have a our tier one of our Patreon is a Discord that you get to join and speak with like minded people. Ninety percent of them are flipping writers, and they talk about writing and give each other great advice. We also uh, have our book club tier, which is our second tier, where you get to do two live streams with us a month. One of which you get to vote and you get to nominate and vote on books that we read at the end of the month and then we have our halfway one Howl's moving castle this weekend is our halfway month uh that we're doing that will Gabrielle pick. also was a, a halfway month pick uh that was a live stream you guys can go check that up in the upper right or left of the image i don't even stick them in the descriptions and then our final fine our well our relatively final tier is the parasocial darlings tier where once a month we do an exclusive live stream where we do take a close reading at a portion from a book i like to say that these reviews that we release on here are a macro look of level look at the book we look at themes we look at plot we look at structure i never knew before this podcast how much i cared about structure but apparently it's one of the arc words for my life but in those live streams we look at the micro we look at prose we look at sentence structure Katie talks about like similes and hanging parsiples. Very interesting stuff. I did one uh, recently on my own for A Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, The video will be named, finally, I get to talk about A Song of Ice and Fire after two and a half years. Uh, I'm actually probably going to release that. But most of them are exclusive to that tier. So I'll release the the first 10 minutes of it on our normal Patreon. But I I don't think they work as well for audio as our normal ones do. But if you do care about the craft of writing and you think you have like, you know, stuff to add, I've gotten some really good feedback during the, these live streams from um our our patrons um join i'd join if i wasn't part of the creative side of it all right go ahead and get us started with the plot this book series or this book i mean it is a series is uh we got a main character her name is susan all right susan lives with her mother in a farmhouse uh near bath susan doesn't know who her papa is she she don't got no papa and her mom is real uh muddled the doctors say she might have done too much of drugs in the 70s even though mama says i didn't do no drugs it's also the 80s in the book so that wasn't that long ago <laughs> yeah it really it, well, i guess it would be the 60s because she's 18 yeah so the 60s in the 60s our girl susan is turning 18 in fact it is the morning of her 18th birthday when the book opens and she has a really weird dream that she has all the time where there's like a monster in the lake and there are these like crow creatures that like talk to her and they're like we do we are here for because of your father and she wakes up can't remember it um her mom is an artist real flighty very rarely is she like fully present in conversations and things um but her girl Susan, now that she's 18, she's going to art school, baby. She's ready to get out to London, but she decides she's going to go to London three months early. She's going to get a job in a pub, but mainly she's going to try to find out who her heckin' father is because her mom has told her fuck all <laughs> about who her dad is. She got like a handful of clues. And um, what you get from this intro is that her dad's probably magical because the weird uh, <laughs> monster creature in her dream said something about her dad asking a favor. Um, and this is kind of like the prologue to the book. So one of the things that I find interesting about this book, and it's almost a bit like a puzzle that I want to try to figure out, is how does he make it so compelling despite the character feeling kind of distant and them also being way too chill about 
all the crazy shit that happens later, but it doesn't rupture your sense of suspension of disbelief in the book. And I think one of the ways he does it is that Susan is a very specific character. She's not Bella Swan or feisty, sassy person number four or um, oh, Alina Starkov and Shadow Vone has this problem a lot where she's just the author. You know, Susan is kind of, I always got a bit of a like a, a punk rock from that time period feel of her. She's got like a shaved head. She has a very specific way of talking that like it really makes her a person. Somewhat in the same way that in Sabriel, Sabriel was a very specific person who was uh, defined by her actions early in the book. So if they're a little bit more distant in terms of their interiority, they're not distant as characters in your understanding. 100%. She also gave me vibes of Blue from the Raven Boys in the yeah. sense that she is a kind of counterculture, but not in this like, ooh, I'm not <laughs> like other girls. Like there's literally a point where it's describing her working in a pub and trying to like, she gets a job and she works in it. And there are entire s sections of the book where it doesn't talk about the fact that she has a shaved head and she like is a bit more like like she, the band tees that she wears. And, and like when those moments come up, you're like, you, you know it's a part of who she is, but the book isn't being like, oh, look, she's so different. She's moody. She's sassy. She got, she don't, she likes the color black and she don't wear pink. You know, like it, it, my, I love that uh, Susan loved the boiler suits. You know what it is? And this is, goes back to what we were talking about. Uh, a, why this feels like a younger YA and B, it feels a little bit more distant. And, it, um, and it's because this is instead of, and look, 30 year old women are fine. 30 year old men are also stupid. Like, don't get me wrong. That's a whole different genre that we just don't read epic fantasy for whatever reason on the channel. But like a lot of <laughs> YA. Very long. That actually uh, also, and also it's just, there's a lot of dudes being dudes and I'm just not interested in it. What it is, is this is not a 30 year old woman, right? <sighs> Maria's cat. It looks super evil right now, guys. For She's trying listeners. to eat my hair. <laughs> evil deeds, evil looks then. Usually authors are kind of writing an idealized, sassier, younger, hotter, more angsty version of themselves. Is what it feels like a lot. Yeah, who their self identity is tied up with. Whereas for this, it felt very much like an adult fondly writing about a child. And the same thing with Blue in the Raven Boys, where it's like, they're rebelling and that's cute, but like, it's cute. It's not a legitimate, you know, movement against the culture. They're not legitimately sassy. They're like a kid being sassy. And I think that's a real narrative distance in terms of how it's, for, or not narrative, that's a real narrative framework that's different. And so the things she does, you can tell the author is fond of her, but the author's identity isn't tied up in her being cool and sexy and badass. And she isn't, and it's it's wonderful because uh, there's a character named Merlin that I'm going to introduce very shortly, but he likes Susan, but he also is uh, like, odd and not like he's like ooh mysterious but none of his family thinks he's cool so it balances it yes and and also because like he isn't like trying to be cool he like unashamedly is like just and it how they balance it is by having moments where the characters are very very normal or having things about them that are very relatable and very normal and then having these little things on the periphery and then the moments when they come in you're you like it, it brings a chuckle instead of because like mm -hmm. i'm just thinking of like books where the, the descriptions of the things that like are just over like they're giving you the eye color over and over again the <laughs> hair color over and over again like let me remind you that they're gorgeous let me remind you how like and the, or they say like she said sassily or like there's like the thing that makes them different is on display the whole time and this book doesn't do that it is there it is part of the description when it is relevant it comes up like there's a point where somebody touches her head and you're, it's a buzzed head and you're like oh yeah that's who she is, but it's it's not like- I looked in the mirror and thought about my head and how I had cut it when my father left because I couldn't do it, like all that stuff. None of that. Uh, and so it just feels like she's just a person, like Merlin is just a person. Uh, and I think it works really well. Anyway, so- Who is Merlin and how do we meet him? We meet Merlin beating up an old dude. <laughs> Cold open. Merlin is in a outfit, and it's funny because there's this one uh, point where it's like, was it a man in a suit or a woman in a suit? We're not really sure. And then at the end, it was like, of the description, it's like, no, 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 it was indeed a man in a suit, and it's Merlin, and he's got a yak hair bag, um, 
which is his thing that comes up over and over again. But I, I love it. It's great. Um, and basically, Merlin is part of the left-handed booksellers of London. What are the left-handed booksellers of London? I'll tell you. Uh, they are uh, a human society. They're the left-handed and right-handed booksellers of London um, that protect Britain from the old world. There's this idea in this world that there is like the old magic-y stuff and every once in a while it comes to the surface and interacts with the new world, the modern world, and that the booksellers are there to kind of deal with things, keep the peace and, uh, you know, smooth things over. Uh, and thus making them, as William said, one of a, a book with a secret society in it. We've read some not great ones. <laughs> so I compare this a lot in my head to Lore, which had the worst, and um, Ninth House, which like had it worked okay in that. Oh, book. you're forgetting the other one, the Book Eaters. Oh God, I thought about that a lot too. Oh, that was awful, especially because this one also has to do with books, but it's so much less stupid. That book and like, it's God, so much better. It's so fascinating how some writers are so much better than other writers. Bar association, I will form it at some point. Only certain authors will be allowed to write. We'll get better outcomes because the uh, capitalism and the publishing industry is failing us right now. Anyway, um, so Merlin is, and the other thing about Merlin to know, oh wait, no, well, let's go to booksellers. So the booksellers of London, again, they're like, they're not the underground police, but they're kind of like the underground police. Um, but what I liked about it is that the way they describe it later is that like there are uh, layers to the world and so a lot of times you can't interact with different layers if you're above them so once you start interacting with the more supernatural layer it can start more interacting with you more because underground society books always have to have some reason that like the it, the the magical stuff doesn't interact. Why why isn't this an alternate history versus a secret society um, kind of a book? And in this case, I thought that was a fairly good explanation of it. Is just that it's actually very hard for um, supernatural creatures and magics and stuff to interact with humans unless they start messing with them. And if you know of them and believe in them, like they they mm -hmm. have to. Um, and I really, I also really liked that as a, a conceit for why it works. I also liked one of the things that I'll say is that, and I'm going to use book eaters as an example because it had to do with books. This book does a much better job of connecting the importance of books to the lives of the <laughs> Like, I love how Merlin kept reading books to chill out after violence. Yes, like it, it, it's so, and it, it was mentioned that a lot of left-handed, so the idea is there are the left-handed booksellers, which are the guys with the swords, the guns. The, the 007s. The, they're the field agents. They go and they do the violent -y stuff. Uh, and then there's the right-handed booksellers. They're more magical. They're more... Um, uh, research, analytical, they can do uh, spells, they're that side of things. Um, and our boy Merlin, he's a left-handed bookseller, but one of the things it talks about is that left-handed booksellers, when they do something violent to keep them from getting too overwhelmed by it, it's literally a thing where they're just supposed to bring books with them so that like <laughs> after something happens, they can uh, read and like disassociate a little bit and get some distance from that thing um, and help them like process it. And I just like, that's such a good way to like function with things. They also brought up a bunch of times where um, authors in the past, like used thing like um, Oberon and Titania from Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And they were like, that's an author who knew too much. Uh, and just like the kinds of things where they connected what they were doing with the authors and literature around them and how like one of their, uh, lead elders is just like a book nerd and he just was spending a bunch of time going through some Russian guy's library. They're called booksellers because they sell the family sells books um in, in stores and like you can tell that they actually know about books. Like this is their job and their profession so much more. They're like, oh, the spine is what this or the ISBN number will go like that or whatever. Um, and it's like, oh yeah, these are professionals in a way that the book eaters in the book eaters didn't seem to actually know that much about books as either an object or a story and so yeah even though there it's less um in terms of the world it should be less the book eaters should have had books more involved in than in this one in this one they feel more like a part of the world than in that one absolutely uh and i really liked that connection i also like the idea of like research and like the analytical side and their connections mm -hmm. with like libraries and like 
all of that worked. Anyway, back to our boy Merlin beating up a guy. Um, he's beating up this dude who's a sipper. And sippers are like what vampires were inspired by. But they like, they don't kill people. They just like sip at your blood slowly for years. And they 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 can go out. It's like a mosquito. Like their spit also heals a little bit. <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah. It does. And um, he's beating up the sipper guy. And then who should come flying out of a back room but our girl Susan. What's she doing here? I'll tell you. She's trying to find her dad. And her mom had this guy, Uncle Jack. I think that's what his name was. Well, I'm going to call him Uncle Jack. Sorry if your name's not Uncle Jack. But anyway, <laughs> uh, her Uncle Jack that she'd come to visit. And it's not actually her uncle. It's just a guy that her mom was friends with back in the day when she lived in London. And um, he sent Christmas cards and postcards every year. So she knew who he was and knew what his address was. And she went to visit. Very quickly realized this guy's kind of shady. Like she walked in and there was a dude holding like a sawed off shotgun like in the corner. And she was like, mm, probably not my father, one would hope. Um, and Merlin is here because this guy has been doing some shady stuff and he's also investigating the death of his mother under mysterious circumstances, um, and ends up killing Sipper Uncle Jack and poor Susan, cause she was in the wrong place at the wrong time, kind of gets brought up and everything. And then there's this fog, uh, that kind of rolls in and they have to, he was like, you have to stay on the path. And this is where we're first introduced to the idea that there are moments where the magical slash old world comes into contact with the new world. And so this fog has, what was the creature in the fog? I don't remember the details of this book terribly well. But anyway, there's this thing in the fog that is coming after them that they're having to avoid. Um, and all of a sudden the fog gets called off and he's like, oh, thank goodness. But then like an arrow comes like, sh also it um gets really quiet because when the fog envelops them, they're no longer in London proper anymore. Uh, and so she can't hear the sounds of the city. But anyway, uh, the fog gets called off and he's like, wow, that's kind of weird. Um, and she's like, I, everything is weird. This is very strange. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. And then an arrow flies out of nowhere and, and it's aimed at our girl Susan, but Merlin jumps in the way and ends up taking an arrow through the leg, I think it was? Hip? I don't know. Um, but anyway, and he was like, oh, shit, the Rod Alpha is like shooting at you. That's weird. And the Rod Alpha are the like guardians of this particular section of uh, London. And she ends up having to spit sipper blood on his wound because, again, medicinal properties of healing flesh. Um and then uh, he gets taken by the police and then she ends up going to, because at when the police find them, they're like, did you shoot this kid? Because uh, Merlin carried a gun and they assumed she did it. And then she ends up talking to this Lieutenant Green. And Lieutenant Green is like, hey, you got involved with the booksellers. They're a weird crowd. It, it would be best if you, to avoid whatever magical stuff surrounds us, I'm the, the agent in charge of them. Go home. Go home, Susie. Forget forget everything you've seen. And Susan's like, nah, I'm here to find my father. I'm staying. <laughs> um, and Lieutenant Green's like, okay, I will... Was it Lieutenant or Captain? I'm pretty sure it's Lieutenant. But anyway, her name's Green. Um, and uh, she's like, fine. If you're going to stay, I'd like to keep my eye on you. So I'm going to put you in some special housing that we have. The rent's way cheaper than anything you could afford. And it's way nicer. You'll go stay there. And Susie's, Susan's like, yeah, absolutely. She goes and she stays there. There's this uh, lady named Mrs. London. So this is the part in the book that's a little bit weird because throughout the second chapter to this part, a lot of stuff is happening super fast in terms of like, she meets the bookseller. She figures out this guy is um, a semi-lame vampire. They go through fog. The police know about this. And like in a lot of books, this would be the point where you and the, the character detach because so much weird stuff is happening to them. And Susan is actually just very chill about all of it. She's not like freaking out or anything. She's kind of taking it somewhat within stride. And so this is somewhere where I think the distance actually helps a little bit because it's like, oh, we don't quite know what's going on in our brain. So it's okay that she's not freaking out as much. I think it's also works okay here because the tone of the book is somewhat less gritty and realistic than um a lot of other books are there's a certain amount of like i wouldn't say whimsy to the book but there's just a bit of of like it definitely a, is some whimsy there's some whimsy i don't love whimsy so i don't like to say things that i like or whimsy. as someone who loved 
uh, The Dark Lord of Durkholm, that book is like 60% whimsy, my book. <sighs> yeah, but that's like Diana Wynne Jones. She's the only one who's allowed whimsy. But in this case, there's a certain amount to which you're, you're like, oh yeah, I'm not supposed to read this as a super realistic um, character. Uh, personality profile you know what i mean like this is a character we're on an adventure it does make it lo somewhat less engaging in that like once she starts to have more like emotions and realistic reactions to her um situation later in the book i started connecting more with events i think this kind of kept me a little bit like this is pleasant but i don't necessarily care this is one of the problems I think like that a lot of readers had with Sabriel, which is especially in the beginning is she is so chill a lot of like, because she's and the distance. And I, we've talked about this with Kushiel where sometimes there was moments where there should have been more emotionality to things that were happening, but because of the distance, you just struggle with that. So it has its pros and cons and people who do not like distant narration are going to struggle a little bit with it. Um, and, just to explain a little bit, because I don't think we have, we've explained this in the past. When we say distant narration, we mean where the emotionality of the character is not at the forefront of the narration. When you are in um, first person, a lot of the times you are in the character's head as they're experiencing it. But then you also have uh, first person, but uh, as if it's being told to you from a later point. And in those cases, it, you can be very distant because it's a retelling. You're not feeling the emotions that the character feels as it's happening and the you're getting uh, a filtered experience of it. Uh, and that distance is what we're talking about. And this is third person, but there's definitely the narrator is not Susan. The narrator is not Merlin. The narrator is flying from head to head to head to head. Uh, and so there is a forced distance uh, as you as the reader to the characters and what they are experiencing in the moment. Yeah, very much so. Uh, there's like different techniques uh, authors will use to try to get more interiority. So for example, like a character talking to themselves, describing a pain in a very um, close, uh, in a very intense way, for example, only being in that character's head, the prose actually um, shaping to what the uh, what the character's thought process is like in that moment. Those are all techniques authors use to get you closer, but sometimes you want to be farther away. Again, uh, having it like, telling a story from a specific time in the future about their previous self. And then even being like, Oh, you know, back then I thought this was crazy, but now I know better as Kushiel does several times. Um, or even talking to the audience, Kushiel in Kushiel at one point, Phaedra is like, and you may think I'm vain, but look, we're, we're, um, whatever that fake country is in that one that's supposed Don to be yeah. we're Don Jolene and we take beauty seriously you guys like that also distances you from the reader or from the character and so in this case I thought it was it was balanced well um but you do tend to get a less engaging read with distance sometimes this and the thing is you're right this next chunk of the book is one of the least compelling uh and not to say that it's not compelling but you aren't as emotionally invested this was the point in the book where i was like okay you know this is fun like this is chill but i I wasn't like gripped to kind of continue. What it is is also there's a lot in the coming part. There's a lot of um, info dumping that happens. And he's and sort going of like, from one place to another to talk to this group of people to go talk to this <laughs> to group explain of more. Yeah. And it's like he's like Novik. He can get away with exposition because it's interesting and he's good at writing it. But I was like, there's no character stakes at this moment. I don't care about what happens to the characters. I don't care about their growth or anything like that. So it's literally just a breadcrumb of of exposition. Um, but I, again, I found it pleasant. I just didn't find it compelling. So it's it's going to be a really interesting. I almost wish we would have read this with our patrons because uh, I would have been really interested to see what their thoughts were uh, on this book and how they would have connected with it. So if any of you, our patrons or, you know, our readers in general want to like read this and give us your feedback, that would be great. I would love to because like Will and I can sometimes have very similar tastes in, in really weird. Like sometimes we are just so completely opposite mm -hmm. and then other times especially when it comes to this kind of stuff i feel like we're pretty in sync and so having some outside like we both went into sabrio thinking like <laughs> <laughs> here, and then our, our patrons were like 
Eh, yeah, it's not so well, and it makes us work harder. Like um, for a song like Achilles and for Sabriel, I knew I needed to back up my opinions and I couldn't just go on vibes because so many people would disagree and you have to be specific when people disagree. Um, so, you know, it's good to do that. So if we get to 10,000 patrons, we'll make every video a live 10,000 patrons? Yeah. 10,000 patrons? If we get to 10,000 patrons, we'll make every video a live stream. I think that's reasonable. How many do we have right now? About 100. New Patreon goal in 10,000. <laughs> See you in 990. Or, yeah, 900. 999. No, we have 100, so it's just 900. I don't, I can't do math. I'm a, that's okay. a, that would have been so funny if the booksellers couldn't do math or like. <laughs> <laughs> like the right-handed couldn't do math at all yeah. or something like that. Our girl, Susan, she gets a job at a pub. She's chilling out. She likes Mrs. London. Uh, there's some like uh, other people there who obviously are there for police, like to put them undercover as well. Uh, and she's kind of living her life. And then uh, one night she like looks out the window while she's trying to sleep and she sees like a weird cat thing uh, that's there. And then it's gone. And just disappears. And she's like, that's kind of weird. What did that lieutenant say about, like... Because uh, Lieutenant Green was like, if anything weird happens... And she ends up going downstairs and she's like, maybe I should talk to someone about this. And then Merlin's on her door doorstep. Except she doesn't quite recognize him at first. And somebody did mention he had a twin sister. Because there's someone who looks like Merlin, but is wearing a very nice dress. But it is Merlin. Merlin just likes fashion of any and all varieties. He's not picky. He's also talked about... The fact that booksellers can change their gender, it's a lot more complicated than just putting <laughs> on a different dress, but he's considered it. And what I like about this is we get a character who is obviously non-binary in presentation and in uh, like kind of how they think about themselves. And it just works so well because it is <laughs> just a natural part of this character and how like, depending on what Merlin's going to do. He's going to dress differently. Not necessarily the most practically, but it's just whatever he wears is an expression of how he is going to interact with the next thing. And I really loved that. And I think he's great. And he's fun. He's a fun character. I think it also helps that the book, again, doesn't have that super hyper-realistic tone. So you don't need to be like, wait, how was hat cross-dressing handled in the you know 80s in London at the time? Why isn't Susan having like whatever social expectation she should be having. It's like, no, this is a slightly less than realistic book. So yeah, you can just have a character who's like that and that's fine and it's, it's cool. Um, and it's really not mentioned a lot in, in no, the No, and it's not, it's one of those things where uh, a lot of times I've heard uh, people in like minorities, whether they're gay, trans, um, where they just want like that to be part of who the character is, but not the entire focus of the character. You know, like, it, can I just have like a romance interest where that like happens to be gay, but like, this isn't about like the persecution they get as a gay, like those kinds of things. And Merlin definitely felt like that as far as being, you know, a differently presenting person. Um, where it was not like the core of his story was not <laughs> that thing. Um, but it was just part of him. And like every once in a while he wore like, like it would get brought up that he's wearing something odd, but like, I'm also like, that is an outfit. Sounds or at one fantastic. point his sister's shirt rips or something. He's like, Oh, I have an extra dress in the back or something like that in his suitcase. I think it is mentioned at one point. Yeah. It's pretty. And he has a yak hair bag. It's just, it's a good, it's a nice little touch. Again, I didn't find him a super compelling character. I didn't find any of the characters super compelling, but I, I thought he was fun. Again, he's very reminiscent of like, um, some of uh, Garth Nix's other characters, specifically, I think of uh, Susie Turquoise Blue from The Keys of the Kingdom. It was one of my favorite characters when I was a child. Yeah, he's a he's a fun character. And again, I think something that a, for like a younger audience would be really fun to read and connect with. Um, anyway, so uh, he takes so the, there's this whole thing where there's this like other. Uh, oh, yeah. When Merlin shows up to get her, she's like, oh, it's you. And he's like. Hey, you want to go out? And she's like, uh, are you coming on to me, sir? And he's <laughs> like, maybe. Uh, but he's also like, I have to take you to like my family. And she's like, what? And then these two thugs come up out of nowhere and are like, we're here for you, girl. And then there's a tussle. And then the police get called. And Lieutenant Green's like, wow, this is weird. And he, Merlin's like, I just have to take her to my family. And she's like, that's probably for the best. Um, and then there's this weird other cop guy who's like, 
I forgot what his name was. Marsh? No, it was, it's, it had an H. Hesh? I'm not being helpful. No, you're not. Hesh was closest <laughs> to whatever is the actual. I listened to it earlier today because I listened to the ending this morning and I'm like, oh, that guy's name is kind of cool and it fits the character really well. And I cannot remember what it is at all right now. Uh, he's basically like tough, bad cop. Who's like, I've been on the streets for 30 years kind of a guy. Exactly that. And um, like, uh, I'm in charge of gangs and the gangs are uh, acting up. So something must be <laughs> Holly. His name was Holly. Paul Hesh is actually a better. I mean, it's, it has Jewish undertones, but Hesh is a cooler name. Yeah. And he's like, oh, what's going on? I'm more because um, they have a run in with. Is this where they have the run-in with the goblins? Okay, so I've missed something. We don't meet Holly yet. Her, So her and um, Merlin go to visit his family, right? And he has an Aunt Audrey who's going to take them in a taxi, but then something ends up happening, and they end up having to get out the taxi. And then a bunch of goblin kids come out of nowhere and dance them into a different reality. And they are now in, like, kind of the Fey realms at a Mayfair from, like, 300 years ago and basically it's a fairy riddle where they have to find the thing that doesn't belong they have to see it three times and call it out and um merlin's like god i wish my sister was here as a left-handed i'm no good at this sort of thing and uh she ends up finding out like she ends up finding uh what the thing is which is there's a flower seller kind of walking around who has a row one rose that is no color um and so they end up using, like, they find that they're able to get out of the um, thing and they end up going to his house. Uh, and he's like, so you're going to meet the, like, the people in charge, which is his very great, 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 great aunt and uncle, Thurston and Marihue. Thurston is the guy in charge of the right-handed and then Marihue is in charge of the left-handed. And, um... As they're going to his family, they go into a bookshop and then they start going up, even though it was only like a two story building. And there's this point where they're going floors and floors up. And she's like, this is kind of weird magic. Hey, um, and uh, there's she's a, an art major. I don't know if I mentioned that she's going to be going to art school. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of art and things as they're walking through the house that is really interesting that she comments on. Uh, and it gives her having her be into art and having it come up several times uh, helped make her feel like a real character with things that she was into outside of just, you know, when you read books and the character just feels like they have no hobbies or I nothing. I know exactly what you mean. It's the same thing that makes uh Feyre from Akatar feel real. She's an impressionist. The computer glitched out, so I can't see your face, but I'm going to assume it was utter disgust. Outside of the, the Feyre comparison, uh, it does make her feel more like a specific person. Um, and the other thing is, through this period, we meet all of the other left-handed, or, or just the booksellers, left-handed and right-handed. And this is where I felt like the book really started to become more interesting to me, because it's such a fun dynamic of like this big, sprawling family. Um, of like eccentric book people and like there's the characters really kind of pop off the page a lot there's one of his aunts for example um is the driver who drives a taxi to like get the left-handed places but also to make a little bit of money she does normal things uh normal like, like normal taxi yeah drive <laughs> pickups even though she's not supposed to um, and she also really acts up her gloucester accents because american tourists like it and uh, we also meet his sister vivian who's one of the right-handed and it's interesting because vivian is not a massively complex or interesting character and it's not harped on a lot but i really liked their sibling dynamic and just i don't know there was something just nice about them being siblings they felt like actual siblings there was a there was a yeah. couple and i can't remember it now but there was a couple conversations they had where they were getting annoyed with each other in like the most sibling oh there was a point where merlin is trying to think and to help him think he's like Ta tapping his foot and then she says stop doing that so he starts like with his tongue and he's doing it to help himself think and she's like you're doing it to annoy me and it's just <laughs> it's the kind of thing where as a sibling you're when your sibling is doing something else you're just so focused on yourself that of course you think it's about you and it was just such a realistic because a lot of times writers get siblings really wrong mm -hmm. again not to once again bring Feyre into the thing but her <laughs> relationship with her sisters and like the first 
part of the first book feels so contrived um, versus this, which just felt like very natural. But uh, we don't meet Vivian yet initially. He goes up, uh, he takes her up to the greats, uh, which are Thurston and Marihue. While he's talking to, oh, she's talking to Thurston and Marihue who are asking her questions, Vivian comes in and almost like trades places with Merlin for a second. And then the two of them are both talking. And basically the th- the reason they brought Susan here is because something is focused on her. Something that isn't the booksellers themselves is very interested in who uh, she is as a person. Um, you have the uh, Radalfa shooting an arrow at her when it definitely doesn't shoot arrows at the booksellers. You have that weird cat creature that showed up. And then you have the goblins trying to dance them into the Fey realms. And they're like, yeah, the Goblins would never do that to a bookseller. For so, so for them to do that, like, what's up? And basically, they're like, okay, your mom's a known entity. Your father is an unknown entity. Your father is probably something weird. We would like to look into it. And she's like, that's what I was doing. Um, and so basically, they're, uh, Vivian is kind of brought on to help them find out, like, uh, on the research side of things. It's, there's also this interesting concept that uh, Vivian was originally left-handed, but now she's right-handed. And she might end up even-handed, which is when you are both magically right and left-handed, um, which is what she would like to be. Um, but she is currently right-handed, and so she does the researchy side of things. It's also worth pointing out that, like, it's not just a hand. Like, their hand is silver. They stuck it in a magic cauldron that we'll talk about in a little bit. And I actually kind of like that there seems to be not only do you get special powers from being left or right-handed, but you kind of lose things. Like, you kind of... And I don't know if this is ever explicitly stated, but I got the sense that, like, the left-handed almost aren't able to think through very complicated ideas because they're left-handed, whereas the right-handed can't do almost any kind of violence at all because yep. they're, they're right-handed. Um, which I thought was like kind of a cool thing. Like it's a nice little touch. Yeah. There's a point where Vivian literally says there are things she can't do anymore now that she's right-handed that she Mm -hmm. misses. And her brother's like, but you were left-handed really recently. And she's (laughs) like, I'm sorry. I can't help you. Oh, it's because she's making fun of how messy the left-handed are. And he's like, you are left-handed. And she's like, not anymore. And it just, it, it works really well as kind of like a world building. And it also helps both sides not to feel too OP. Um, Mm -hmm. as far as what they can do. But anyway, um, also Thurston, like uncle Thurston is like, by the way, before you, Oh, they're like, Merlin needs to stay with her to take care of her and make sure nothing happens. Vivian's going to help with the research and grandmother would like to speak to her. And everybody's like, (gasps) grandmother wants to speak to her. And, Vivian and Merlin are nervous and Susan's like who the heck is grandmother and they're like it's not necessarily who but multiple who's our grandmother. <laughs> Part of this the, the contrast that helps here is that we haven't mentioned but Thurston and Mayhew are like the most normal old people like Mayhew really kind of just wants all this to be done so she can go fishing and yep. and uh, the the I don't remember what his name is but he he is very like I kind of just yeah I, I just said the word and I already forgot it. Um, he very much just wants to get back to doing like collecting some weird books. And again, there's like this wonderful, like um, family business type of feel to the booksellers. That's really, I think one of the strengths of the book and it's one of his strengths is doing again, that Britishy dialogue um, and, and that what's helps, but they're very normal. And so now we're going to go see grandmother. The, the unnormal. Uh, and basically, so we also learned that Thurston and Mary Hugh are both like 200, 300 years old. The booksellers live a while, But when they die, some of the women in the family become part of the entity of grandmother. And basically, it is where you go down to this, like, deep part of the basement, and you go to your, their ancestors, basically, their female ancestors for guidance, help. Um, And so they go down there, and they see one of the grandmothers, and they're also like, and the dogs, god damn it. (laughs) They're annoying dogs. I hope it's not the wolf hound. And so there's the grandmother and whoever her dog was in life who joins her as this like spectral person, but the grandmothers don't like new people oftentimes. And sometimes if they don't recognize you as one of their offspring, uh, they're going to attack you as well. Uh, And so Susan has the, like not only do Vivian and Merlin have to like convince grandmother that they're part of the family, but they also, they're like, how are we going to get Susan in without grandmother attacking her? And they're like, ah, 
Susan, you have to give her a gift. And they decide that she'll give uh, Grandmother the glass flower she got from the goblins because Grandmother likes goblin magic glass stuff. And Susan originally wanted to keep it, but it's goblin, so it's going to disappear at sunset. So they go down, and at first they're like, hi, we're Vivian Merlin, uh, kids of so-and-so, who was kids of so-and-so. And they go through the matrilineal line, um, and it's like so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so, uh, like seven generations back. And then we're like, ah, yes, how are you two doing? Um, and so then Susan gives the gift, and then um, basically the grandmother is like, I will help you because they were like, can you help us find out who her father is? And she was like, I will help you, but I will require some blood for my doggo. And then also uh, some blood to figure out who you are. And at first they're like, are you going to slit her throat? And it's real dramatic. And she's like, a drop. You have potatoes, <laughs> one for me, one for my dog. Like, relax. <laughs> um, so she takes a drop of the blood and she analyzes it. And then she's like, Nah, this is older than me. This isn't, I don't have this. So then you get a different grandmother who's a couple hundred years older. And so, and you can tell by what they're wearing. And then that grandmother's like, nope, this, this predates me. And it keeps going back and back until suddenly the grandmothers are not speaking English. And then you get to the oldest one, which is like Roman-esque in like the, the robes. And she's got red hair and she's got like a giant wolfhound uh, next to her. And she's the oldest of the the family and she's like ah oh, this blood also predates me but i know what it is her father is an old one uh and she can uh who can bound anyone to their will you know this is pretty powerful stuff and then like afterwards uh yeah. merlin and Viv uh, vivian are being really cagey about what grandmother said and they're not mentioning anything around the other booksellers and eventually susan's like why are you being so cagey about this and they're like so you don't have a normal fae or mythical father you have like th there are very powerful ancient mythic creatures that are like conceptual uh creatures and i always love this i love mm -hmm. ancient magic that is conceptual and like tied to the earth less physical oh i love it and basically there's a bunch of these things all over europe and some of them are like in a like their locus is in a rock or like different things and they're like your dad is one of those and that makes you potentially super powerful the old ones can make bargains like make people uh obey them and that is like especially because you could make a bookseller obey you and that's and so in the past the booksellers used to just kill uh, <laughs> half old one kids. And we don't do that anymore, but we still don't want to like. But it it, it was in the 1800s the last time we did it too. So we haven't tested it for a while. And Thurston and Mary Hugh were both around for that. So like maybe not chance it. Uh, so we're just going to keep that under wraps. Um, and so they're like, oh shit, now we have to figure this out. So there's a whole funny thing where they're trying to eat. And they can't find any place to eat. But they end up going back to the hotel where Merlin lives to get... He's going to put on a new outfit. And then they're going to go to the cafeteria there to eat. And then as they're getting ready to leave, there's a funny bit where Merlin has like a big drooping mustache. <laughs> um, but anyway, as they're going to leave, uh, they smell like a floral smell uh, that has like rotting underneath it. And they're like... Vivian and Merlin are like, oh shit. And Susan's like, um, what do you mean, oh shit? And basically they said that this smell, though they've never actually interacted with one, is what the textbook smell for a thing called the cauldron born. And it's basically this world's versions of zombies and what it is. Okay, I got to nerd out for a minute here. So you a go. lot of people's first like big fantasy epic is Lord of the Rings, right? Mine was not. Mine was a series called The Pride Ain Chronicles by Lloyd Alexander. And in those, probably the best known one is the second book called The Black Cauldron. And that's because that series has the cauldron born. It's, um, I'm assuming it's probably tying into an older legend that Garth Nix is referencing here, but maybe not because this book mentions a lot of book stuff. So he could have just taken direct inspiration from those. But anyway, what happens is if you put a dead body into the cauldron, 
then it will come out as a super durable zombie, essentially, that you can control. And they're just unstoppable. And this is where Garth Nix gets to do his like, oh, I actually can write really creepy enemies that everybody's afraid of with the mounting dread thing that he did in Sabriel all over again. Um, and so it's really cool. It really is because there is like that entire chapter, even though nothing actually happens, has some of the most tension in the book. There's literally a scene where like this old couple walks past them and you're like, are those the cauldron board? <laughs> and then somebody's like, what if it's a rat? <laughs> like, what if it's a cauldron board rat? And you're like, oh God, is there going to be like a swarm of rats coming through? And, and there's just a lot of tension with it. Um, and basically there hasn't been a cauldron born for 300 years, mainly because the cauldrons are these massive magic uh, powers. Like, and they're huge cauldrons. They're not like bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. Like I could put a chicken in this. Like, as Will said, you can put a whole body. A whole ass human. A, a whole bear goes into one. <laughs> yeah, so that's th true at one point. They're pretty big. Um, and there was a like six cauldrons or there was an amount of cauldrons, but a bunch of them have gone missing. Some of them have been destroyed. They have, they don't call theirs a cauldron. They call theirs a grail. <laughs> And there's a grail keeper and they're like, Merlin is like on this weird because Merlin and Vivian's mother was murdered uh, and Merlin suspects foul play, but nobody investigated it to a point. And it wasn't until like a year ago, which was a couple years after she died, that he got enough evidence to say, hey, this is really suspicious. Um, and so he's got uh, suspicion on his brain. So he's like, the only cauldron we know about that could do this is ours what if the grail keeper's turned what if somebody is abusing it because they're like the grail keeper wouldn't do this but what if somebody else is abusing it and then they're like what if one of the other grails because there's a there was like a bronze one an iron one what if the one of the other ones that we thought was lost isn't actually lost so there's this whole drama surrounding that anyway the cauldron born doesn't appear. Uh, they end up calling. They're smart. One of the things I love about this is they never just deal with stuff. They immediately call yeah. adults. I fucking love this so much. <laughs> Once I got past the age of like 20, I was not here for books where kids were just dealing with things that adults should be dealing with. Like I think about Harry Potter all the time and the fact that like children were just like, doing the thing 80 mm -hmm. no, percent of the time and you're like no where are the fucking adults and so immediately when they think they smell an cauldron born they call their aunt una who's like the they their cover is like a biker gang um but like <laughs> the adults even though there hasn't been a cauldron born in 300 years they treat it seriously they close it down they get people in they start uh investigating you know what also is is that like they actually have an organization, which in so many books, it's like, we're going rogue. There's only us. We can't trust anyone else in the organization. But like in this one, there's a sense of like, oh no, there's a team involved in this kind of a thing. If you need a security detail, it's not not to have just like one hot body card and one bed. You know what I mean? Like that trope. But like, no, there's a team. We're going to handle it sensibly. Yeah. And I really appreciate that. But anyway, the no cauldron born to be seen. They're kind of like, mm, did we see it? But they're, the, the kids are kind of certain about it. Everyone else is like, that's kind of weird. Um, anyway, so they go back to Mrs. London's, the place that uh, uh, Susan is staying. And Merlin is going to spend the night uh, in the room opposite hers. And Vivian's there. And there's this moment before Vivian leaves for the night. And Susan is tired. She just wants to go to bed. And Vivian comes in and is like, hey, I kind of as a right-handed, sometimes get some visions. And I got a vision that you might need a knife and some salt later. And she thinks it's, and she's really hesitant to do this because the old ones bind people to them and make them obey them through salt in their blood. And so her being like, I think Susan is going to need salt and a knife is basically her being like, I think Susan's going to have to bind someone. Uh, and so she, she debated back and forth about giving her this, but she decides to trust her gut and her vision. And she gives uh, Susan literally like a sharpened butter knife in a ruler case and three packs, like the little packets of salt and was like, use them when you need them. Um, and that's going to sit 
a while and I love there's, how it actually there's three Chekhov's guns that go off with those salt packets and each is both is, is like hilarious it's so good I love it it's so good um but anyway and and it's such a good because you you think you know how it's gonna get used when they first appear and then it ends up not being that and it Nyx has a really good way of subverting your expectations mm-hmm. while also telling a story you know how sometimes writers feel like they have to pull a plot twist out of the air yes. uh and it, it to make it compelling and there are parts of this book that are predictable but in a way that makes sense in in that way where it's not predictable but things led from one thing to another so it makes sense that that's how it would go um but anyway uh, and so then they go to sleep and while she's sleeping, this thing happens where like she wakes up and she hears something and Merlin's like yelling at something and she, uh, there's something outside trying to come closer and green that cop from earlier is out there. And he's like, don't shoot until it gets, uh, closer. Like, don't, don't shoot it. And, uh, cause one of the things you learn is all the buildings that are controlled by the, uh, booksellers are warded and the only way to get rid of the wards is with a lot of fresh blood and so when he says like don't shoot them it's because they're literally uh fresh blood and mercury and he can see that the people coming at them some of which are called from born are wearing vests with mercury in it so if she shoots them too close to the wards it's going to automatically undo them um and while that's happening our girl susan is in uh bed and she feels something dripping from her ceiling and then the ceiling comes in turns out the goblins are back they slid a couple people's throats on the roof wearing mercury vests and they've just been bleeding out on there just eating through the wards super gross very <laughs> dark <laughs> you're like the heck oh I should say something else happened in between this that I forgot. They go and they visit these two aunt Helen and aunt something who are right-handed. They work in kind of, they work in the new bookshop or the old book. I don't know, but they, they are researchers and the things that um, our girl Susan has, like she has a silver cigarette case that was her father's and uh, they figure out that, the weird symbol on the front is actually, if you trace it as an etching is a little silhouette of a mountain and they start looking into some other things. Uh, and they're going to look into and try to see if through this library card in this thing, who her father was. Uh, so all of that had happened previously during the day while they were out and about. Um, but anyway, so, uh, the goblins have gotten in. They grab our girl, Susan. She's trying to fight. Um, Merlin gave her a sword. She did fencing lessons for years. So he he gave her a nice little saber, but not helping her. They they literally uh, grab her, take her up, hop her to a different house where there is a giant Fenris wolf just waiting there. It takes her up in its mouth. I like the scene of it because it like puts its mouth around her, but then it starts digging into the ground so that it can it can get a good grip of her. Uh, without hurting her and he just fucks off merlin at the last minute sees this throws his ancient sword at it what is excalibur right like that's the implication they never say it but i think it is right because it also it comes from the grail and he's like it'll show up in the grail again at some point if i lose it yeah it's this really interesting idea because like it's just this there's this point where vivian's like you weren't supposed to have that sword and you lost it (laughs) and so the idea is it's a really important sword. Um, but anyway, so the wolf takes our girl, Susan. Merlin sees this happen. He threw the sword. It embeds itself in the wolf. Eventually, Vivian comes and is like, what the heck happened? And he's like, oh, shit. They took our girl. They went that way, I think. Um, also, there's that. Oh, I forgot to mention this. There's that weird detective. He was there the night before all of this happened that we talked about, Holly, who's all like, um, uh, my unit is the gangs of uh, <laughs> London and I've been keeping them under peace and now things are going crazy. What are you guys doing? Who is this Susan girl? And he's just like a dick and Green does not like him. And she's also like, he is super lazy. I don't know why he's this interested in everything. So immediately you're like, fuck Holly. Fuck the horse he rode in on. I don't like that guy. He's shifty. Our boy Merlin and Vivian are like, we gotta go find Susan. And what they realize is Vivian can trace the sword using its scabbard uh, to uh, locate it. 
Um, and so they have to, they go to Audrey, they ask if they can take her taxi, they explain what's going on. And they're like, this is why we didn't tell you before, but we need to go help Susan. And Audrey's like, I'm just going to leave my cab. Y'all do (laughs) with it what you want. And so they get into her cab and they start booking it after, um, Susan. Now what ends up happening with Susan is that wolf is just going, it's like half real, half not real where like, when she touches it, it feels almost watery, but there is a resistance to it. But it starts slowing down because that sword has iron in it. And it is slowly poisoning the wolf to the point where it is really laboring. And it ends up taking her to the middle of this one forest in the middle of gosh darn nowhere to a well. And out of the well comes like a water spirit lady. Um, the kind that like just as easily could eat you as help you. Th- th- that kind one of those fey uh and the it reminded fey- me of the one from uh the bear and the nightingale the yes yes the risulka yeah yeah so uh the wolf's like in pain and the lady in the well is like i can't help you i'm not touching that sword that's heckin gross it's really funny because <laughs> what happens is that susan goes look look i'll take out the sword but i'm not going back with you and she's and and the uh result uh, that's not what she is but the the pond lady is like he she because the wolf is a female might you know try to take you anyway and susan's like well if i take out the sword it'll save its life and then i'll have a sword and I'll be able to handle it. And so she goes to pull it out. And the thing is, she pulls it out, but it's much less uh, substantial than she thought the wolf. So she so immediately she goes... falls into the lake. <laughs> just, just... And it's, it's so funny because it's it's built up as like a serious scene of her going to do this mm-hmm. thing. And what if the wolf turns on her? And it's just immediately cut. And these are those mm-hmm. moments where uh, Nyx builds up a scene in a certain way and then kind of subverts your expectations also the character's expectations she thought this was going to be like a mighty (laughs) fool uh and she ends up just completely on her butt and it's another example of the author not taking the character as seriously as you would in like a torrid love affair novel like sarah j mass this ain't it this ain't it um but yeah so once the sword is out the wolf is like i'm going to take you and then the lady of the well is like no i only said that but because I wanted her to make the decision on her own, but no, I'm not going to let you take her to somebody who might want to do her harm. So no. And the lady in the lake also healed Susan because she wasn't doing too hot either and made her like outfit nicer again. Um, And so then the wolf fucks off to go tell whoever has it under control because the Fenrises are their own creatures and should not be under someone else's control, which means an old one potentially is the one controlling it. Bum, bum, bum. Is it Susan's papa trying to bring her home? <laughs> is that what it is? That's what I thought it was initially. Yeah, uh, it's not. Anyway, <laughs> um, and so then the lady of the lake is like, uh, good luck, Susan. So Susan's got her the giant sword. She's trying to find her way out, but eventually she realizes she's in an, in an enchanted wood that's not going to let her out. Uh, on the flip side of things, Merlin and Vivian are busting down the road. And then there's a point where a police car comes out of nowhere and the police are enchanted, which means somebody has been messing with their minds and starts shooting at them. And Merlin shoots back and he is a very good shot, but he didn't shoot to kill, but he ends up killing two of the officers. And it really affects him because he does not like shooting or killing innocents. It was not intentional. He didn't. And at the time he didn't realize they were bespelled and that they were being used against their will. Um, So it felt a little bit more justified to shoot them. And then finding out that they were completely innocent people who had no idea why they were there. Cause one of them survives and comes to. It's interesting because in going back to the idea of whimsy and Garth Nix and also in Diana Wynne Jones, actually their books are a little bit whimsical at times, but then they also go really hard sometimes in an unexpected way. Like the woman who was, taking care of um mrs london who was like the he- the house person of where susan was staying she died we got a death scene with her and then yeah. here like he just murdered an innocent person and he's not okay with it he he like he needs to read a lot of books afterwards like yeah. and it, it goes much harder than you would think for a child story so they end up having to steal a different car uh so that they can continue on uh so they end up doing that and then they end up in the woods and they're trying to find susan but they can't Again, she's in a magic woods. And eventually Susan realizes, I'm just going to ask the woods to let me go. And the woods are like, okay, 
<laughs> open up, let her through. And then immediately she finds uh, Merlin and Vivian because, again, they were tracking the sword. The gang's all back together again, and they're like, okay, we need to go to Silvermere. We need to go to our Grail Keeper. Some things are weird. And at this point, they're suspecting Thurston or Marihu or that there's some foul plot because who would have connections to magic and connections to the police to be able to affect the things that have happened in this day the way they have outside of a bookseller. And so they're a little bit distrustful. They're not sure what's happening and they decide they're going to go to Silvermere. Silvermere is the realm between realms where their grail keeper lives. Their grail keeper is a mythic entity that takes care of their giant cauldron. Again, they were a little unsure about whether their cauldron was compromised and was what was making the cauldron uh, born from earlier. So they end up going to Silvermere and they're walking on a path. And while they're walking on this path, and it's a magical path, and they ha- you have to stay on the path, nothing, like, there's uh, things around this you trying to get scene. you off the path. It's such a good scene. There's something creepy. There's, like, purple eyes in the darkness trying to, like, get Susan off the path. But at the same time, uh, Vivian has some very important news to tell Susan. She heard back from Aunt Helen and Aunt whoever uh, about Susan's papa. But they have to talk in a way because there's like music playing. And so they end up having to like yell. And like at one point, Merlin is like singing badly, but he's talking to them. Like he's using the words of the conversation in song form because the discordance of that is making the fey magic that is trying to suck them in not work as well. Um, And basically, it's a great scene. You You know what it reminded me a lot of is in the Golden Enclaves um, when Elle and What's-Her-Face are going through the less than real world and they keep having to have very mundane conversations to make the path think that it's a place. Still, yeah, that they remind me very much of that. I loved it. And it it really gives it a sense of atmosphere and like creepiness, but also like uh, uh, whimsy because they're having to have like this very like, they're having to have a very serious conversation but there's all this silliness surrounding yeah it. and uh merlin is singing that one um i am the model of a oh there is this a very uh, famous um, sullivan the, and something song i know the, uh, the, the Mass um, i am the very called? model of a, of a modern, modern major general, general. general. yeah it's yeah. from the pirates of penzance <laughs> basically what susan tells her is her father is the old man of coniston which is a specific mountain slot in Britain that is like it's a landmark basically and she's like my father is the old man of Coniston but what this tells him is her father is one of the good old ones a benevolent one not one of the malevolent (laughs) and shitty ones uh he's he's a pretty good boy but he's been kind of dormant for a while because one of the booksellers was like I'm pretty sure your dad's gone um, which is weird because if her dad was gone, she should have his powers because they should be coming to her. And in this last third of the book, uh, she begins to feel like this anticipation, this like thing inside her that is beginning to wake up. And there's points where she's like, no, 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 <laughs> let's ignore that. <laughs> As they're getting to kind of a crescendo of their conversation on this path place, all of a sudden she's not there anymore. She, there, Merlin and Vivian aren't there. She's in a like little glen wood place and there's a little girl on a rock and the little girl starts speaking to her but it has a deep man's voice at first and then it's like oh sorry i thought this would be a better way for you to meet me (laughs) and it changes to a little girl's voice and basically this is the grail keeper and the grail keeper tells her like hey you can't be with vivian and merlin They're eating right now in Silvermere. You weren't invited. The only people who are supposed to come here are supposed to be invited. You weren't invited, so you can't be with them right now. But I'm willing to help you. And uh, because she's like, I think I need to go see my father. I that like there's a there's a like a pull inside her that says go go see Papa. And Silvermere, the uh, Grail Keeper, is like, yeah, that that sounds about right. So uh, the girl keeper takes her to a point where she can like, she has to jump into this like very deep lake to go to where her father is. And she's having a little bit of nerves about it and she doesn't do it. And then all of a sudden the grail keeper's like, oh, we just got a complication. And you're like, what? And something the grail keeper mentions is that the grail keeper is having multiple conversations. And so something has obviously affected it in a different place that is having this. And then all of a sudden, Marahue is there. And Marahue throws a knife 
and our girl Susan, the grail keeper, catches it. Maryhew, by the way, who's wearing a fishing vest because she was fishing. That's what all she really wanted to do. I love that as a character detail. Maryhew is fucked up. Basically, Maryhew is one of the leaders of the book keepers, uh, the booksellers, and she made a deal with a different old one to keep make things peaceful for the booksellers. And peace did happen. They've had the most peace for the past 60 years. And what this has done is it allowed her and Thurston to indulge in their hobbies, but at the expense of some things that we're about to find out. Uh, but anyway, so Marahue, and you're immediately like, Marahue, you were the one <laughs> in the bookseller community that was fucking shit up. We, we knew it was one of you. Um, and she basically is like, I can't believe you're being this annoying to our girl Susan and like I should have dealt like I didn't realize your mother and father had you um otherwise I would have dealt with this um and you're like Mary he what did you get into but she's trying to kill and uh, Silver Mirror's the girl keeper's like you're not you're not gonna kill her here and she's like fine I'll just follow her outside of this and the girl keeper's like I'm gonna give you a head start Susan so Susan jumps in and ends up at the base of the mountain that is her father. And she immediately feels like a pull towards this place and like a sense of belonging. And, and she can feel the power beneath her feet. But something else is pulling the majority of it. It's getting pulled somewhere else. And she automatically knows it's not her father. So she starts trekking up the uh, Actually, no, she doesn't trek up the mountain. She ends up popping onto the mountain in the middle of the campsite of some hiker who was getting ready to have a sandwich, who was just, like, chilling. And he's like, who the hell are you? And she's like, don't worry about me, but you should probably leave. And he immediately starts leaving. And she realizes, oh, shit, I have very persuasive uh, commanding powers when I'm on my father's land. That's interesting. Uh, so she starts heading up the mountain. And uh, someone had given her, I think it was the grill keeper who basically told her, by the way, your enemies are going to be there. Enemies with a plural. So obviously there's Mary Hugh, but there's somebody else we're dealing with. And as she comes up the mountain to where her father is, she finds that there's a cairn of rocks. And sitting next to the cairn is a cairn. God, I'm hilarious, guys. Join our Patreon so you can support independent h hilarity and comedy. So like this. funny um it's it's lieutenant holly it's holly it's the the cop guy from earlier turns out because holly had a, a watch on that they knew was a magical item of some sort and they thought it was a protection charm and they were like that's kind of weird that he still has that it's not it's a disguise charm holly is one of the old ones he is the old one of southall and he's one of the malevolent ones and 18 years ago, he made a deal with Marihu where he would take the power of old the old man of Coniston, also ca called Coniston Rex, the king of Coniston, um, and take the copper grail that Coniston protected. And if Marihu helped, he would keep peace in the London area and England, um, which he has done, but he's not a good guy. Right? So obviously he's not doing things the best of ways. So he bound her father with her mother's hair because the only way to bound an old one is to bind them using something of what they love a lot. And so he literally used her mother's hair to bind uh, her father in the earth. Uh, and that's why her, her father's power, despite him, because he's still technically alive, the uh, Southall has been using it this whole time and why she can barely get access to it despite being on her father's land at this time. Um, and so her and Southall are having a bit of a like showdown and there's this point where he's like coming towards her and she's like, oh my God, what do I do? But she has that butter knife and that packet of salt and she thinks, okay, I'm going to, Vivian saw it. I'm going to try get him. Chekhov's gun. Yeah, I'm going to get him to be my servant. So she she mixes the salt on her hand. She cuts her hand so her blood. And then she goes to like swack it onto him. And she cuts him at the same time to get some of his blood. But he doesn't bleed because her his body is just a vessel for whatever his spirit is. It ain't. There's no blood. There's no nothing happening. And he's like, ha, ha, ha. Number one, you didn't say the words. You need words for a command. Number two, you can't command me with that shit. You're too weak. Uh, and then basically he's like, listen, I'll give you the same bargain I gave your father. Give me your father's power. 
and I'll let you live, and I'll let your mom live. Otherwise, if you try to take your father's power from me, I'll kill you, and I'll kill your mama. And she's like, well, this doesn't sound good. And then Merlin and Vivian get there. Um, they also, they came out of Silvermere. It was very funny. They were eating, and then they remembered Susan existed, <laughs> and they get out of Silvermere, but they didn't have shoes. <laughs> and they literally, like, ran their way up this mountain shoeless. And uh, Merlin cuts off Southall's head slash Holly's head. It's a great subversion of how these scenes normally play out where like the good guy and the bad guy face off and talk to each other. Like uh, Vivian shows up and is like, okay. And he's like, hi, you think you can stop me? And then immediately from behind uh, Merlin cuts his head off. But the thing is like, he's an old one. That's a not enough to stop him. But it's such a great subversion of how those scenes usually play out where you're like, if you had hit him in the beginning, this would not be an issue. Yeah. If you hadn't let him talk for 20 minutes, you would have been fine. Um, but, uh, the head keeps trying to fly back onto the body. And there's literally a point where he puts his sword blade on the neck of the body to keep it. And he has to like, punts it off and it starts. And she realizes that she can feel the head and where it is within her father's kingdom. And she's trying to pull magic into herself. She's been trying to pull as much magic away from South Oz as she can, but she realizes that number one, she can't pull magic fast enough. Number two, there's no way she can hold enough in her mortal body to be effective against him. So then she's like, there's only a, one other thing I can do, motherfuckers. And she's like, I have the knife. And she releases. So uh, South was like, I'm going to kill your papa. You're going to watch me do it. So he like lifts all the rocks off the kern. And there's like a grave that her father's lying in bound by her mother's hair. So she just starts sawing at the hair. Uh, she unbounds her father. He comes to, he's got like a, like his nails have grown so long. They've like curled in on themselves. Uh, and he's like, South, oh, get off my land, you cretin. And he like punts and South, oh, to like takes a smoky crow form. And he ends up getting like thrown back to his own locus and place of home. And then her father's like, thank you, daughter. But is like super like formal and, and like, it's not the loving reunion. Uh, yeah. He's not the great guy she thought he, thought he wanted. She wanted him to be. He's a conceptual creature. Um, anyway, and then he's like, I'm tired. I'm going to take a nap for like, I won't come back for about a year. But you guys need to go get my copper cauldron from that guy and bring it back here. But that's the task I'm putting on you. And they're like, okay. Sounds like a plan. And basically what her father does, like, like kind of the last moment, is he gives her permanently a portion of his power that she's able to actually have as a human, um, but keeps the majority of his. And what this has done is limited the amount of power South all has. But the Copper Cauldron is super powerful in how he's been making the stupid uh, cauldron born and has its own power source. So like they got to get it away. I actually thought this part of the book was where it was going to end. Cause it felt like, okay, we had built to one ending and it was good. And then in the sequel, they're going to go do this. And it's, it was interesting because I actually didn't love this moment as the conclusion. Yeah. I thought it was a little easy. Yeah. And I was like, no, I don't like this. Also, I forgot to mention something as the Vivian and Merlin were coming up the mountain, they found Marahue fighting the cauldron oh, yeah. born. Uh, and she ends up like tumbling a rock on them, but then it ends up squishing her own legs and she ends up dying. And as she dies, cause they were like, Mary Hugh, how could you do this? And she was like, I thought 60, I thought the piece would be worth it. I, I thought I was making a decision that was good for the booksellers. And she's like, but it's fine. I will die and go to the grandmothers now. And then the really old Roman grandma pops up. And again, she's young. Like she's the oldest of the grandmothers, but she looks like she's a 30 year old uh, pops up and is like, nah, Mary Hugh, you betrayed the family. You ain't coming to us. And then she's like, but what about my dog? Yeah. And they were like, we'll take your dog when it's her time and she can come stay with us but you don't get to. The dogs are always faithful. And I was like, oh, it's yeah, the pup. It's such a great little like world building detail that their dogs always go with them. But it, it, like in this moment, you're like, oh no, wait, the dog isn't just an addendum. Like it's, it, that's part of the tradition. And I just thought that was kind of cute. And it, it also was just like a really sad moment. Cause like mm -hmm. a way to make you feel for a character you've never ca cared about before is to bring an animal into it. And so knowing that she has, she's left behind cause her doggy, who she loves and you know she was gonna die and she was like but will my dog get to go into the afterlife <laughs> the way it was supposed to and they're like yeah and then like it was just it, it, for a character that like i liked as a 
background character, it ended up being a way more compelling death. I think that says something about Garth Nix and how he writes characters and that even a minor character can then transition to being the villain and then a sympathetic character and then dying in a way that you like, they can take the weight. It's not like all of a sudden, like the character needed to really rev up to be able to handle that much emotional energy in the book. It's like, no, this, this seems real. It, like this feels kind of real too, in terms of the human stakes of the situation. And it worked really well. Also, this is the moment where Merlin's like, were you responsible for my mother's murder? And she was like, uh, I wasn't responsible, but I didn't realize it was happening. But it did technically happen under my watch. Uh, and he was like, cuss you. Um, but anyway, so then uh, now that all this has happened, the booksellers have sent a helicopter to come get them. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> the old man at Coniston is like, um, there was some evil people waiting down the stairs uh, at the foot of the mountain. Uh, I stopped their hearts. <laughs> and so they go down to the base of the mountain and there's just like three Land Rovers with like dead people inside. And there's this point where they're like, well, we need one of these Land Rovers to go drive somewhere. So uh, we're going to take them. And they're like moving dead bodies. And Susan literally has this moment where like a lot of the shock that has been moving her and she's like oh my god i'm moving a dead body and she has like a very strong like like her father wasn't who he she he, she wanted him to be she's moving a dead body the whole nine yards um but they end up taking some of the weapons and the land rover they end up driving to no 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 we get the best part of this book which is they're at the pub and they get a sandwich and she oh, realizes no, this was at, no it was on the mountain so was oh, it on the mountain she's, she's still yeah she's still really hungry they're coming down the mountain and she's like i'm starving and they were like oh well we found there was a camper yeah. down there and he left his roast beef sandwich so here you go she takes a bite out of it and she's like oh he could use a little and she like goes into her pocket because because <laughs> there was a point where she was like oh vivian the knife was useful, but the salt packet wasn't. And then they were like, maybe the sandwich will need salt. And it does. <laughs> and that's why they needed the salt. And you're like. <laughs> such a great Chekhov's gun. It's such a great Chekhov. Because it did. It made the sandwich so much yummier. It is what the sandwich needed. It needed salt. They go down the mountain. They end up at uh, this one pub that makes really good bacon sandwiches, of which she eats uh, the bacon sandwich as well because she's really hungry. Uh, and then a helicopter ends up getting sent for them because there's literally a point where they're like, Okay, they tell the adults, we need to get the Copper Cauldron from Southaw. He is very powerful. He knows we're going to come for him. We need to get it away from him. And we need to put Southaw to sleep. And uh, they're like, okay, the adults are going to go deal with that and deal with Southaw. We're going to get flown home. We're going to go to sleep. Great times. They get in the helicopter. And as they're driving towards London, the like pilot is like, it, it, this is such a good scene because you mm -hmm. really feel for like the pilot. Because what happens is when they get picked up by the the helicopter, the helicopter and, and the cabin uh, crew captain, uh, they think that the three of them are like 007 uh, spy type things. And there's another like, whatever you're in, we don't care. We don't really understand why you're carrying a sword, but whatever. And over the comm system, the um, captain is like, uh, I can't tell you where we're going or what we're doing, but we'll be there in like an hour. Uh, don't give us your names. Like, it's a very funny scene. As they get closer, there's a fog coming and Merlin is like, don't fly into any weird weather. Any weird weather you see, go away from it. And they were like, no, 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 we don't have clearance to go anywhere else. This is the place where we've been told to land. We have to go there. So they end up going into the fog. And as they go into the fog, birds start crashing into the uh, windows of the helicopter, like hundreds of birds. And the helicopter ends up crashing down into the earth. And Susan, Vivian, Merlin, and the one cabin attendant are okay, but the entire front of the uh, helicopter, including the pilot and the co-pilot, is just smashed up to bits and pieces. And when they look around them, it's not the rich, affluent neighborhood that they should be in. Um, it is trees, a field of grass and rocks, and just like a giant tree in the background. And like they're like, what the heck? And then what they realized is Southaw took his locus of power, the place around his locus of power, and took it out of town time. And they are now trapped in it. And they know what is probably happening is that the um, 
booksellers of the modern age are trying to draw it back into time so that they can put South off to sleep and get the cauldron. And so they're like, oh shit, we are stuck inside. And then Merlin's like, well, listen, if we're here, we need to be helpful. Or I think it's Vivian where she's like, listen, they're trying to, they're the booksellers, adults, and South are having a head to head. If we can distract them in here, it will be helpful and it will help us get back home. Um, so they decide they're going to try be distracting. A bunch of stuff ha- ends up happening. They fight an undead bear. It's pretty dope. Merlin ends up breaking both of his legs uh, and has to crawl himself across at some point. Uh, Vivian, uh, I forgot what happened with him. Also, there was this really cute moment where the, like the cabin attendant helicopter lady was like a reenactment yeah, person she- and recognized his story. It was just, it's a really cute moment um uh but anyway and basically it ends up being just our girl susan a sword and being like i need to distract south thought and uh so at first she starts just like calling out being like south thought i've come to get my dad's cauldron is my cauldron motherfucker it's mine by <laughs> right which like angers him enough that like some of the modern world starts coming back in but like they're kind of going at it and it's her against the bear at this point, so mano y mano. Um, and she ends up binding the bear to her will. Cause like, she's like, how am I going to defeat this bear? What am I going to do? And she ends up cutting, like doing the salts. Cause she has the third, so, third salt packet. She was given three salt packets. She ends up using all of them. She binds the bear and in binding the bear, she's able to briefly cut off its contact with the person, whoever was controlling it. Um, and, uh she now can get to she sees like she's able to cut off the connection of the bear to whoever was controlling it um so she ends up going towards the cauldron and she realizes her best chance at distracting south is doing something really drastic and merlin realizes as he watches her run and again he's dragging himself across the ground because his legs are broken, that he had previously told her that one of the ways to destroy a cauldron was to put an entire life person inside it and it would just just the person would die and it would destroy the cauldron and he was like oh no susan's gonna do it she jumps into the cauldron immediately it's back to the modern world all the booksellers are standing around the tree that is the locus of south of power they are chanting the binding song merlin is watching he's he's literally sobbing his eyes out because he thinks susan is dead he's also listening to them uh, chant something that he's heard but he's never seen used in practice they're able they subdue south all they put him down and he's like susan is dead <laughs> and then baby comes and is like more more love and he was like susan and she's like buddy the cauldron's still there if susan was well no what it is is there's a bunch of cauldron born still floating around and he was like she's like if the cauldron was destroyed these cauldron born wouldn't be. And he was like, pick me up. So she like firemans him <laughs> and they go to the cauldron and out pops Susan. And he was like, why would you do that? You nearly died. And she's like, well, two, two reasons. Number one, it's my dad's cauldron. So I was really banking on that, not killing me. And she's like, you also said an entire person had to be put in. She's like, I kept my one hand outside the rim mm. to keep me from fully going in. And that's how she ends up breaking her collarbone. Um, and she's like, and so I just kept my hand out and then I pulled myself out afterwards. And so they end up, Southall gets put to sleep. Uh, and there's been, throughout this whole book, there's been like Merlin obviously interested in her, her kind of into Merlin, but being like, that guy's bad news. He goes through girls, like he, he probably gets infatuated with girls as often as he tra- uh, changes his outfit. And so she's like, no, no, no. But then there's certain points where she's like, maybe I'll give it a chance. And earlier he was like, maybe you'll let me go out with you. And she was I will ask you out on a date <laughs> at some point. And he was like, oh, I look forward to it. Um, but they have a moment and she kisses him and it's cute. And it's it's funny because Vivian's there as well. And she's like, I ship it. Like It might work. It'll be good yeah, for him. It, yeah. Then they go to see her mom at the end. They're going to convalesce there. And what I loved here is that she tells her mom like, oh, I, f- I met dad. He was the old man of the mountain. And his, her mom's like, I remember now. Well, it was probably for the best. We wouldn't have worked out anyway. And I think that yeah. was such a great, because like, it's it, it's such a great reframing of like, oh, the mother isn't important in a story or like she got left behind tragically. And it's like, no, we probably, we, we just would not have worked out. 
It wasn't tragic. It just wouldn't have worked out. It was great. It was great for the time, but like I was a city loving hippie. <laughs> yeah. And he he was a mountain and some trees. Like it's not my life. <laughs> and it was just such a great because he also was very chill about her. Which, you know, I, I would love the whole tragic, like, oh, we haven't met it. Like, you know, me and Maria are suckers for that kind of thing, but this also has like kind of a wonderful subversion to it. Yeah. And that's the book pretty much. Um, there's a sequel, which again we were thinking of doing, but I just didn't really think was worth it. Um I don't know. You said you would be interested in reading it, right? I'm I'm going to. I'm going to somehow fit it in. I got about three fourths the way through uh the Dream Stealers, uh, which is the second book to the Raven Boys. So once I'm done with that series, I will try this one. You know, I really like Garth Nix as an author, and I think this book works because he's a really good author, but I don't think this is him at like the top of his form, and I can't say that I was especially interested in what happens next like this was harmless but there's no real reason i didn't identify super strong with any of the characters there's like the plot was okay but i'm not crazy about what happens next um again mostly the way i interacted with this book was sort of as a puzzle as to how does he make these things work when they don't work in other care in other works that we've read like yep. the book eaters or how how to make like a teen romance that feels like realistic to teenagers or just teenage characters in general there's so many small things that he does that work really well that like we've talked about some of them again sabriel also kind of had a lot of his writing hallmarks. And that's one of the reasons I think that book works as well as it does. But that book, I feel like just has a very distinctive feel, whereas this one feels more undistinctive. It's a, it's just a little, it feels almost not generic, but it feels like something that in somebody else's other, somebody else's hands would be generic. It really does. Like there is yeah. so many ways this book could have ended up very mid and the fact that it isn't is really surprising and i think really just comes down to nick's being a good writer and again this is the kind of like if you're watching this and you have like a niece or nephew who's like into fantasy stuff and you'd like to give them a good like a good book that is interesting has some cool dynamics i think Christmas is around the corner. <laughs> you could uh, go to a bookseller to get this. Um, a left-handed one. Um, An yeah, independent. So, oh, thank. Yes. Ugh. Yeah. So if you guys have read this book, let us know what you think in the comments. Let us know what you think of the sequel, too. Because uh, I am kind of curious about it in terms of how he opens up the world. Just not enough to actually, like, read it. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.